this thing yet, and uh, I knew that there were bad, there were bad rains coming. That we had a, some of the world's best forecasters basically say, "Hey, you guys have had a two-week window of, <coughs> of like a almost a dry spell where it hasn't been raining, and now the actual monsoon rains are going to hit again." And so our plan would have never worked once those rains came because it was going to flood all those areas that we had pumped down and rediverted the water. The, the, the rains would have basically flooded over those dams and then those dry spots that we had marked with tanks for tank swaps would have become uh, dives and, and not wades and our plan wouldn't have worked. And so we were basically racing against the clock and this was a week prior to us actually executing the rescue and uh, we still didn't have approval yet and, and we couldn't go forth, you know, like I said, we were advising and assisting and, and all we could do was, was basically, you know, brief and say, hey, we think that this is probably going to be our best course of action and carry through with it. So uh, that Friday night, I think it was the it was the day before our rock drill, was when the, the big wigs flew in, I, you know, because I, I said, hey, if we don't kick this thing off soon, like, we're going to lose our window. So they brought in some of the, the higher level people, the, the, the Minister of the Interior, the Prime Minister, and then the, the King's, the King has like a royal guard of generals. And I had to basically walk him through my little map, and, and, and you know, the, the joint team was in there, and we walked him through every single step. And then th the very next day, I said, if you guys come out tomorrow, we're going to do a, a rock drill rehearsal or a rehearsal of concept and basically show uh, how we're going to do this. So, you know, in the military, normally it's pretty funny. Everybody's in uniform and, you know, we have a lot more strict policies. But since this is, was such a hodgepodge of people, like um, Jason there came down like in his underwear or swimming suit. And here you got, you know, the highest levels of leadership and everybody's kind of just down there. Um, but the purpose of this was to show them, hey, th this is exactly how we're going to try to carry this thing out. And it was actually, uh, these chairs were kind of the sections of the cave, uh, and we put up this red line that kind of outlined the cave, and then we had all the, all the water bottles indicating where we were going to have tanks, how many we were going to need, the swaps. And, th and this was actually one of those gee whiz moments where I said, well, they brought up all this oxygen, this medical oxygen, to run a line two and a half kilometers back, and all of it's sitting here. I said, what if... What if we fill the diving cylinders with oxygen instead of regular compressed air? That way, if there is a leak in the mask or something happens, the kids are going to be hypersaturated and they'll have a, a higher chance of surviving. And the deepest part of the cave wasn't more than 23, 25 feet. So O2 toxicity and diving below 33 feet is kind of an issue, but for this, it wasn't. So it was genius. We were able to get all that O2, and all the kids' bottles were marked differently, and they were 100% or as close to 100% O2 as possible. And the, and the other diver bottles that didn't have the green tape were just regular compressed air. So the kids got all the green ones. At, at this point, after the rock drill, I, I asked him, I'm like, okay, sir, you know, we did three full iterations of the rock drill that day. And he's like, yep, you guys are approved. I got the, I got the green light. So at that point, um, the last big thing to talk about was the sedation. And, and this is kind of after talking with Doc Rush, um, everybody said it was a bad idea, but it was either do this or, or the kids stay, stay in there and die. So uh, initially they got a milligram of alprazolam given PO at the cave site to calm them down. And then a milligram of atropine because we were, uh, Dr. Harris was talking about them over salivating and maybe having issues in their full face mask. And they got an initial dose of five milligrams per kilogram of ketamine IM. We had to give it through the wetsuits, and then we had to bump them throughout the cave. So uh, each bump was going to be 2.5 milligrams per kilogram, and we basically split them into categories of either 40 or 50 kilograms. They were all pretty small kids, so uh, some of the divers all basically had pre-drawn uh, up syringes that we had in little dry bags, and um, and you know we had guys uh, support divers kind of located throughout the cave, and that was uh, during those tank swaps if they needed a ketamine bump, that's what they got. That's actually one of the, when they went back in in March, they found one of the syringes there uh, from, from Academy. As I said, there was a, the, the rescue occurred over three days. I think that was the, the easiest way that we were, a, after talking about all the different ways to do it, bringing out four at a time was going to be the most feasible and basically looking at, uh, you know, resources and having to restock the cave with equipment. Uh, we weren't going to be able to do more than four per day. The first day, uh, it was incredible. You know, you want to talk about holding your breath. We thought, when I briefed the Minister of Interior, they were asking me about a chance of success, and I said, we're, we're probably going to lose half of them, maybe more. Um, and that was a really hard conversation to have, but, you know, being completely honest uh, was the only way that we could deal with this and take emotion out of it, you know. Um, but it was a miracle. Like, 
our plan worked, the, the mass didn't leak. Um, and then, you know, a after each day, it would, it would be about a 12 hour day, we would rehearse, talk about what needed to happen for the night shift to restock, and then we would, we would do it again. So we got four out the first day, four out the second day, and then th the last day, the uh, four kids and the coach. Here's a little better picture of kind of how, how they were brought out on the diving sections. Um, since, I'm, since I'm, I'm pretty much running out of time, I'm just going to kind of skip over uh, some of the other details. Uh, I'll just show you guys some of the pictures. These are the actual kids coming out. They were, they were buttoned up in a sked coat when they hit the uh, last third of the cave and the tank was uh, and full face, ma full face masks were placed. Here you can see uh, every check or e each stop we would do O2 checks on them make sure they were breathing, make sure that their vitals were okay. Here's uh, the, the initial seals that went in to stay with the kids. Here's the, uh, it was a pretty emotional time after we got them all out, the parents all wanted to come and say thank you. Um, here's a picture with the parents. Here's, here's the guys that were not part of the U.S. team. Uh, on the right, you got the Australians. Uh, the, the, the top picture is the Brits. The bottom picture was, we, we call them the, the Euro divers. They were just support divers, but also really good guys uh, and technical cave diver experts. This was the core group of guys after they got all the kids out after the last day. They pretty much worked uh, the majority of the risk. A mix of uh, US, Australian, British, and Thai. This was the cave mouth uh, in September after it fully flooded. And then uh, this is kind of the big lessons learned slide. So leadership, command, and control. You, you got to have a clear uh, guidance for intent, end state, and having a clear task organization is crucial, especially within cross-cultural and joint interagency communications in, in complex and dangerous environments. Uh, language was a big problem, and then you know having high versus low context cultures was a big problem. Uh, and so really just establishing that uh, centralized you know, chain of command was huge. The cultural empathy and, pr and professionalism, you know, having to tell people that you're probably going to be bringing out dead kids was one of the harder things I've had to do. But if you take emotion out of it and you don't, and you just be honest with them, I think that was the easiest way to go about doing business. It was a huge risk that we were taking, but I think that uh, at the end of the day, that, you know, we showed them that there was no other way, and if we didn't do anything, that they were for sure going to die. Um, you know, relationships in, th in these cultures are key. You have to develop and build trust amongst foreign leadership. Cr you know. For us, it was all about credibility. They trusted us, and it gave us the freedom to maneuver and operate how we wanted to and build our plans. Be professional, even when you know people are making wrong and dangerous decisions. You know, sometimes they would do stuff, like I said, behind our back that would drive me uh, very upset. But being able to just internalize that, take care of it in a closed room, and then come back out was huge. You know, and then understanding the supportive versus supporting relationship and where you fit into that. Teamwork, obviously, was huge. Th you know. All in all, when you talk about everyone that helped support, there was thousands, people doing laundry, people making food for us, you know. Uh, and then the, the last one that he kind of touched on earlier was the critical decision making. So you're not always presented with good options. You know, they wanted a zero risk option, which didn't exist. And uh, for problems like this, try to gather all the facts, understand the knowns and unknowns, and, and be humble uh, And when you receive input from all possible sources. Take into account and, um, and war game all the potential mishaps. Be humble, but be bold when you're decision making. Make key decisions and provide information without emotion. Emotion often clouds judgment, especially when lives are on the line and you're making these decisions. And then the media, uh, you're always on the record. This was probably one of the most media intensive things that I've ever had to deal with. And, and uh, just being able to ha have you know, the media not only you know, kind of pushed away, but when we did the rescue, it was important to to have them off site, and that was one of our red lines. Was like, hey, if we're having to bring dead bodies out of this cave, like it's not going to be on the front cover of CNN. And so that was one of our red lines. And so understanding how to deal with the media, and then having a dedicated spokesperson to to be able to deal with the media. All right, I'm sorry. I I, I knew I was going to go over my time. Uh, if you guys have other questions, and you guys can find me later on. But thanks for your time.
won't leave you. We are incredibly grateful for your leadership, your innovation, uh, your insightfulness, and your ability to pull this off. Congratulations. Again, we thank you. <laughs> now, in front of you are some of the world's largest concentration of mass raw ego. <laughs> this group represents over 40 states and some 14 foreign countries on the individuals who are decision makers in policy, in hospital, in regional planning, and they're here because they're committed to the medical patient care and the leadership and the dealing with what you have shown us uh, in an ideal way to address in a methodical, almost engineering way, how you solve a problem. You will never again have this opportunity to have this great a concentration of individuals who tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, 20 years from now will be faced with a similar situation in their hospital, in their town, in their state, 